Hey folks, Dr. Mike Isertel here for Renaissance Periodization, RP Plus, and RP University, supposedly, to talk to you about Muscle Gain Periodization Lecture 5 in Nutritional Approaches to Gaining Muscle. Let's get into it and see what we're getting ourselves started up with today. So, uh, first we're going to try to answer a question of why not just keep gaining indefinitely? What is really the problem with that? Because if we can't find any problems with that, we should just keep gaining indefinitely. Being big, big is awesome. And if that's what you want, it seems like a very straightforward approach. It has its problems when we get into those. After we sort of define what their problems are, we're going to define a formal need for fat loss phases right after. Okay. Clearly we can't keep gaining forever. And if, you know, we can't keep gaining forever, maybe that's going to have something to do with body fat. We'll get into that for sure. We're going to talk about why fat loss phases are important. Then, you know, we could start to think, okay, we've got a muscle gain phases and then fat loss phases and muscle gain phases, and we could just zigzag through those forever. Turns out there is a little bit of a need for what are called maintenance phases. We'll define them. We'll talk about where they come from and why there might be a need there. And then we're going to describe how that gives birth to a phasic structure, a periodized structure for growing muscle over the long term. So that nutrition for muscle gain isn't just about eating more and growing and growing and growing in a linear way. There's going to have to be some kind of structured approach that makes sense over the long long term. A really quick analogy there is if you want to be good at your job and productive at work, the approach isn't just to do work, do work, do work forever and just keep getting better and better at your work. You know, you get tired from work. You might need a weekend here and there. Sometimes weekends aren't enough and you might need a holiday season here and there to get away from work for quite a while. You may need to shift your scope and projects at work, so on and so forth. So even if your job is to just try to do as good of work as possible, it's not just a linear approach of let's just get the work done forever. There's going to have to be some nuance and there's going to have to be some phasic structure that develops. We call that phasic structure in sports science periodization. So after that, we'll do a quick sample of long-term gain periodization. It's going to be really complicated on the slides or what you're going to see there, but we're going to sort of pick out how to spot periodization and spot the general trends. The example is going to be fairly complex. It's for a competitive bodybuilder, but we're going to inspect some elements of that periodization and really point out, okay, here's where the gain phases are. Here's where the maintenance phases are. That's why they are where they are. Here's where the fat loss phases are and why they are structured the way they are to accomplish the goal that we want. All right, let's get into it. First topic, why not just keep gaining, right? So people will say things like, you don't need periodization for muscle growth, right? You just just fucking grow, just eat and lift and you'll get huge, right? And they'll say, just, you know, lift and eat and you'll grow. It's fine advice for beginners, right? But advice for beginners tends not to work for more advanced people sometimes, right? And so the question is, the answer is yes, you will grow muscle if you just keep eating and so on and so forth. But for how long can you keep this up? One of the sort of hard delimiters on this process is the fact that you cannot continually be in a surplus without accumulating a considerable amount of fat gain, right? And how is that a problem? Well, here's the deal. If you just want to be big, like you don't care if it's muscle or fat, you want plenty of muscle, but a lot of fat too, doesn't matter. You're going to try to be a sumo wrestler. Then potentially you can, you know, if you want to be 35% body fat later in your life and huge, you're just fine gaining probably, right? That's not a big deal. We're going to talk about a little bit how for other reasons, it might not be the best way to do things, but if you don't really care about how fat you are, then a linear gain approach definitely has fewer downsides for you. But if you you know, are a person who is doing this for appearance purposes or for sport performance purposes, and you're any sport but a sumo wrestler, the continual gain approach probably isn't good because you're going to have to rein in your body fat at least every now and again. So something to at least get body fat in check every now and again is a very, very good idea. Never mind even the problem with P ratios, right? And we'll talk about that in a bit. But yes, it's very well known that as you gain more body fat, your proclivity to gain more and more muscle goes down, right? So if you're gaining body fat and you're, or sorry, if you're gaining weight and you're 10% body fat, you gain a certain amount of muscle. If you're 20% body fat, you actually gain more fat uh, on average. And if you're 30%, you gain a lot of fat and not a ton of muscle. So that becomes a problem. But just even never mind the P ratios, even if that's not such a big effect, because P ratios are not a huge effect. Never mind the P ratios, that's not such a big effect. Potentially, it's okay if it's not a huge effect because uh, it's one of those things that just the body fat itself is a bad enough problem, right? All right. 
Body fat's a bad problem. Let's put that formally and talk about the need for fat loss phases. Why do we need them potentially? Here's why. First, the obvious, because all hypercaloric periods of gaining weight are muscle and fat gain periods. So if you're trying to do lean gains or something like that, you're gaining only muscle and no fat, over the long term, that's very possible by doing dedicated muscle and fat gain phases and then dedicated fat loss phases, and then you do enough of those and eventually you gain a net no body fat or very little, and you gain a net huge amount of muscle. But not both at the same time, right? It's kind of like saying, you know, when you're working hard on something and you're doing a real good job at work, fatigue from work just comes with the process, okay? There's nobody in any real serious career that's working dozens of hours a week and is like, man, I can just do this forever with no weekends. I'm not really sure what your job is. Whatever your job is, you're not pushing yourself hard enough at work to be your most productive. If you're really good at what you do at work, you're going to accumulate some fatigue, right? And, and you're going to have to take dedicated times to get rid of that fatigue. That's what evenings are for. That's what sleep is for. That's what weekends are for. So when you're a medical resident and you're going to be a doctor, I guess that doesn't apply for a couple of years. But nobody says a, a feedback about the process like, oh, you know, it was great. It's really tough and it's not the best way to do things. You need breaks. Just the same way hypercaloric periods bring body fat. They just do. Now, someone could say, look, I don't take it overboard. I gain at really slow rates. I keep my diet really clean. I do a lot of cardio. Yes, that will minimize the amount of fat gain, but it will also minimize the amount of muscle gain, right? Is there a good healthy balance to, uh, there that you gain plenty of fat or sorry, plenty of muscle, but not a ton of fat? Yes. But eventually that mathematical relationship of some fat always comes with holds. And it's going to be more fat than you would concomitantly expect for a normalizing of body fat percentage. So it's not like you gain the same percent of muscle and fat as you go. It's not like at 190 pounds, you are 12% fat and you gain fat and gain muscle at such a rate that you are 220 pounds later and 12% fat. If you just gain straight, your percentage of body fat will go up. It does it every single time if you're sufficiently advanced. Beginners, this doesn't apply to. But then again, if we're just talking about nutrition for muscle gain for beginners, just eat food eat some protein and you'll grow. It's not much advice. This is more getting in the weeds when you start to really have trouble with gains. Number two, P ratios, right? Partitioning ratios, we talked about them last time. P ratios are the ratio of the amount of muscle you gain versus fat that you gain when you add body weight, right? So a perfect example of something that improves your P ratio Bear with me, super complex, weight training, right? Imagine gaining weight without weight training. You just eat more, right? Your P ratio is awful. You gain mostly fat and very little muscle. If you weight train, your P ratio gets much better. You gain a whole lot more fat and not, or sorry, a whole lot more muscle and not nearly as much fat. Pretty good. But one effect of the uh, on the P ratio is your actual body fat level. So if you're gaining and you're around 10%, so if you gain from 10 to 15% body fat as a male or oh, 15 to 22% body fat as a female, you're going to be gaining at a very, very good P ratio, at least as far as body fat is concerned. So as your body fat percentage is going to set you up for mostly muscle gains to the extent that you're able and not bias you towards fat gains. Take that same person and instead start them out at 25% body fat, and then they gain to 30, you gain more fat and less muscle than we would expect, right? Just because the body fats are different. So put it in a much simpler way, being fatter means you gain less muscle when you gain weight. As you can see, that's a big problem for us because if you say, I'm gonna gain forever, by the time you get in the 20s and 30s and body fat percent, and if you're a female in the 30s and 40s, you're getting to the point where you're really kind of spinning your wheels a lot. Somebody could ask you, hey, how much muscle have you gained in the last six months? And you're like, gee, you know, if we're gonna be objective about it, probably like a pound. Like, how much body fat have you gained? Like, probably like 12 pounds. Like, wow, is it really worth it at that point? Like, do you still gain muscle? Absolutely. Some of the athletes, um, as uh, Eric Helms has pointed out, some of the athletes with the highest lean body masses in sport are sumo wrestlers. Well, that's because they're a gigantic. Because they weigh 400 pounds, you're going to have some muscle under there and you're trained your whole life. But their muscle to fat ratios are not amazing. And would they gain more muscle if they got leaner every now and again, like strongman or something? Almost certainly. Next one. This is a common one uh, that a lot of people miss. Fat gain is unhealthy. 
if you gain fat past a sort of normal range, athletic range, it starts to mess with your health, especially in the long term. You probably won't feel the effects currently because you're an athlete, you're active, but it all adds up over time. It puts extra stress on your organs. It's bad for your hormonal system and 50 trillion other different ways that being over fat is not a good idea. So fat gain is not the greatest thing in the world. And if you're just gaining to super high body fats all the time because you're not taking fat loss phases when you need to, you're just not going to be super healthy. So fat loss phases, good for uh, making sure that just to reduce the body fat level for its own sake, because P ratios are improved after a fat loss phase and you gain more muscle after a fat loss phase, because fat gain is very unhealthy. And even if none of these other things apply, it's just no good reason to get to 30 or 40% fat uh, if you want to live a good, productive, healthy life. Number four, let's say you don't care about your health. You're a bodybuilder. You're a strong man, uh, especially if you're a bodybuilder at this point. Next point applies. And you're like, whatever, I'll, I'll do a, all the fat loss diets in the world once I'm big enough. So you never sort of uh, intermittently do fat loss diets to keep body weight and you know, body fat in check. Here's the problem. You could say, I should want to get to 300 pounds and then I'll cut down. You get to 300 and then you cut down to 220, right? Huge fat loss phase, huge lifetime of muscle gain. Okay, you gained a lot of muscle and you lost all the fat. Well, here's the deal. Gaining that much fat, getting into the 20s and 30s, especially the 30s and body fat percent, leaves permanent side effects that you can't get rid of. One of them is loose skin. And if you gain enough fat and it changes the physical shape of your body to the naked eye, a lot of that is an expansion of skin cells and a stretching of the skin. And that takes a long time to resorb, years. Sometimes if it's bad enough, it requires uh, corrective surgery. So basically, if you decide to get enormous and then you go back to having a small waist, you're going to have loose skin that hangs over a little bit. Even if it doesn't hang over, it's going to look a little bit uh, looser and it's going to keep you from having that shrink-wrapped appearance that you want when you're super lean. So you pay that price for years afterwards, if not in some cases forever, right? You don't want to get surgery to get the fat off, loose skin off. That's that's a huge investment itself. It comes with its own recovery timelines, a high risk of all kinds of stuff, real nasty way to go about it. So if you, you can avoid it with some fat loss phases, that's really for the best. Here's another thing. As you gain a lot of body fat, your fat cells, what they do is they hypertrophy. So they get bigger, they fill up with fat. When your muscle cells hypertrophy, they just get bigger to a point and then they have some satellite cells they can throw in there, but they fundamentally don't undergo hyperplasia. They don't undergo cell division and cell replication. They just undergo, undergo hypertrophy, which is the physical growth of a singular cell. Fat cells do undergo hyperplasia and they go under, undergo hyperplasia very reliably in, in humans. This has been shown time and again. So what does that mean? Well, let's say you start with, you know, 10 fat cells. I mean, it's like hundreds of trillions or whatever, but we'll just say 10 to keep it easy. You start out with 10 and they all fill up to the point where they can't add any more uh, fat and they still have their own myonuclear domain from a couple lectures back. They can only control a cell of such big size. When they get to their myonuclear domain ceiling, the bigger, the biggest the cell will get, there's a process trigger that causes cell division. So now the cell divides, cuts in half, and now you have two smaller fat cells. And then you keep gaining weight and those two fat cells divide and so on and so forth. And here's the deal. When you lose a bunch of weight later, after you've made all the cell division, all the cells shrink, but they don't die. They're always around. They shrink down real small so you can be lean again, but the number of cells that you have is very, very well connected to. It's causing a variety of hormonal uh, and other factors to be differently, regula or different, different, well, bleh, differently regulated in the body. I got it, baby. You don't have to cut that out, Scotty. I got this. So the different regulation results in the following. If you have more fat cells, you tend to be hungrier. If you have more fat cells, your settling point and set point tends to be higher forever. This has been shown very well in folks that have lost lots and lots of weight. Unfortunately, the vast majority of those people will go back up to their previous weight within a year's time. And most of those people that keep the weight off, keep it off to some extent, but not to a complete extent. The more fat cells you have in number, the higher the drive is to get back to your earlier fatter appearance. The same thing is true in muscle tissue, by the way. If you have satellite cells that have been integrated into the myonuclear domain, right, they have actually entered muscle cell and, and, and added their nuclei. Once you have that, even if you stop lifting weights and your muscles shrink, when you start lifting weights again, your muscles blow up 
way faster, like an order of magnitude faster than you would expect. Regaining lost muscle size is like snap easy. A couple months of training and you're damn near as big as you ever were. And you could have quit for years. I mean, it's unbelievable rates of muscle growth when you come back. Why? Because you have all those nuclei in there ready to integrate tons of muscle mass into their structures because they're all there and turned on. They never leave. Fat cells is the same thing. They're independent cells, but the more nuclei you have, because cell division causes more nuclei, the more that as soon as you start to, if you fall off your diet and you have five fat cells, you gain weight. And then as the cells get big, they, they start to really shut down hunger activity. And you're like, good God, if you're trying to gain weight on purpose, you're like, I don't even want to eat anymore. But if you have a bunch of fat cells, they're like, yeah, bring on the food. And as you eat, they get bigger and bigger and bigger and they divide again, bigger and bigger, bigger and so on and so forth. So if you want to make it permanently difficult for yourself to get lean and stay leaner, then gaining a ton of body fat at any one time is a great idea. If you want to alter the way your body looks and your skin shape, it's also a good idea. But those are all really not great things. I can't emphasize this point enough. All of this stuff, especially the permanent stuff from high body fat gain, is not something you want to burden yourself with. Probably one of the biggest pieces of epidemiological advice or epidemiologically informed advice someone could give you about how to make sure you don't end up obese is don't become obese in the first place. Okay. As soon as you're dealing with someone who's a very high body fat, you already have a host of really nasty, um, considerably intractable problems. Intractable means very difficult to change, right? That's a bad thing. As I said, someone comes up, it, it's, it's almost like, um, you know, once you, uh, I'm sure many of you folks played sports, once you have like an injury in like your knee, your knee gets to feeling good, but if it's a bad enough injury, it never quite feels the same again. And you're always a little bit concerned of that knee. It could be years ago, but some scar tissue there, so on and so forth, especially if you hurt it a couple of times, it's just never back to 100%. Gaining a ton of body fat does that to your metabolic system, to your proclivity for fat gain, and to your, your body shape, so on and so forth. It's just nothing you want to sign yourself up for, right? And I myself, I had done this process where I got really, really way over fat, and I'm still dealing with a variety of these issues. Uh, I mean, they're not a huge deal because I didn't go super overboard, but I wish I would have done less. Real important point there. So where does this leave us with sort of gain rates and targets? Well, gaining from 10-ish percent body fat to somewhere between 15 and 20, uh, myself and some of the other folks in our industry, some other experts, we have a very, very good lively debate about what that number should be or how expansive that range really is. I'll say this. If someone says 15% is a hard stop, they're probably over-exaggerating the data. You can gain to 16, 17, 18%, no problem. It's not too much fat. You'll be just fine. If you're a competitor, you probably in bodybuilding or physique, you probably don't want to get too much above 15% as a male because it's just a huge road down, right? Unless you do a double pump diet or something like that. Uh, once you're over 20% fat, uh, gee, you know, it starts to be a hard, difficult process to justify, especially if you're in physique sport. If you're a power lifter or weight lifter thrower, you might have some justification. But if you're just doing mass for mass sake, anything above 20% for males seems not like a good idea. For females, the numbers are maybe 15 to 17% as a bottom end, because below 15%, we tend to see a disruption of the menstrual cycle, so on and so forth, really, really bad for muscle gains and health, all the way up to probably about 30% in females. So if you're a female and you want to be lean and jacked, and someone says, hey, you should do a muscle gain phase, if you're like, great, I'll get to 35%, Man, that's probably a bit uh, outlandish. I think keeping it to 30% is probably a decent idea for most folks. Uh, and uh, anything above 15%, really 17-ish, uh, is a good place to start. Um, really got to bring this up because it's a sort of elephant in the room. Males and females are not the same. They are not identical. Thus, they have different recommendations. Uh, fortunately or not, uh, I guess it is what it is, but the muscle gain part of the fitness industry is mostly male dominated and thus male focused and dominated, not in some nefarious sense, but in the sense that just most of the folks that want to put on muscle, most, not all happen to be male. So a lot of the guidelines coming out on body fats and stuff, they're just not even being labeled as male. They're just labeled as here's the percentage, right? And a lot of females get into this sport and they say, well, gee, I need to get down to 10% to accurately gain muscle. I mean, I've met folks at seminars that say this. The thing is 10% female is ripped to shreds. You can see the striations in her jaw because females have a, a, a fertility fat that doesn't just, you know, squish right off the body like males do. And there's just baseline body fat is higher and there's not a damn thing wrong with that. It's just a difference. So females have to be mindful of that. 
a 15 to 17 percent body fat female is usually just going to be pretty stripped up and ready to gain awesome amount of muscle and up to 30 ish percent females are very athletic very uh you know there's no like fat pouring over that sort of thing because a lot of times people look at 30 percent and they're like oh my god 30 percent i mean that even remotely an athlete tons of female athletes are 30 percent and in that range it's totally fine now when you get into the 40s and stuff yeah clearly you a little bit overboard but it, make sure to take that in mind all right, so we know we can gain for a while, but we also know we need fat loss phases every now and again. All right, we know actually how long we need to gain because the last time, so three to six months of gaining and then probably a fat loss phase to get rid of the stored fat and then maybe we can get back to that again. Maybe, but it turns out maybe not because of maintenance phases. So the question here is, can we, you know, mass and cut, mass and cut, mass and cut up and down indefinitely? Yeah, we could, but we run into some things. Here's the thing, point number one. When you are gaining muscle and when you're losing fat, the requirement is that you train at minimum at high-ish volumes at least. Maybe not always your highest volume, certainly during muscle gain you will at times, but something like minimum effective volume and above. That by definition is a volume that is net fatiguing. It is accumulatively fatiguing, which means Week after week, month after month of training above minimum effective volume means your fatigue will accumulate and at some point will get to really unsustainable levels. You're going to need a break from that kind of training somewhere. And here is the kicker. You say, okay, great. We'll take a training break. But are you going to take a training break that has you training at maintenance volumes just to keep your muscle but reduce fatigue? Are you going to take that break when you're gaining weight? Well, no, because you just gain pure body fat. I mean, literally, by definition, maintaining muscle mass. So when you are hypercaloric, you're just going to gain pure body fat. So no. And then are you going to gain, or sorry, are you going to take that break uh, or your maintenance phase during a hypocaloric phase when you're fat loss dieting? Well, gee, you know, it's real tough to drop fatigue when you're hypocaloric. So again, that's a no. Well, it's all not a second. We got, we said we can mass cut, mass cut, mass cut indefinitely, but well, clearly we can't. If we're training hard, that means we're going to have to have some point where we're eating isocalorically, maintaining our body weight, training very easily, at least with lower volumes, and letting our fatigue dissipate. That's a real kicker. All right. So that's point number one. Next, if we remember from the last lecture, there is such a thing uh, as preparatory growth versus contractile tissue growth. Not all mass gains are equal, and early mass gains might not stick around if you supply them in suboptimal conditions shortly after. You have done a lot of preparatory growth, but after a while, uh, you know, if you're not doing a real good job of continuing that growth, it's not going to get filled in with actual contractile tissue growth that's going to be uh, sticking around later. Right. So basically, if you gain a bunch of mass and then just go right to a hard cutting phase that lasts a long time right after, man, you know, you might not keep all those gains and it'll just be mostly preparatory, at least some preparatory growth that never converts to actual long term growth. Not a good thing. But maybe if we take a maintenance phase after we get up to that new body weight, hold it for a while, we can still see lagging residual hypertrophy that is actual contractile hypertrophy. Even though we're not in a hypercaloric phase, at least we're not hypocaloric and definitely shutting down hypertrophy in a big way. Next point here is we might benefit from a settling point readjustment. We mentioned this earlier in the last lecture of if you're going to gain muscle that sticks, you probably have to gain enough weight to be different than you were before, like notably. Or do you gain from 140 to 142 pounds? Like, gee, your body can't even tell you put anything on. I mean, you go back to your old ways of eating and um, an activity and you're just going to go back to 140. You might have gained a little bit of muscle, but it's not going to be much. What you need to do is get up to a new body weight, say 140 to 150, and stay there for a while, a couple of months maybe, maybe at least a month, really settle in, get that preparatory growth to be contractile growth, really recharge that settling point so that your body thinks you're really supposed to weigh 150 or close to it. And when you do a fat loss phase, it just does balloon right down to the weight you always weighed, right? Definitely some food for thought there. Maybe not a good idea to just go right into a fat loss phase after a gain phase. Now, Last point here, it's not a major point, but it definitely has some consideration. Psychologically, if you're always either bulking or cutting, bulking or cutting, bulking or cutting, you're always doing something. You're always on a mission to go somewhere. You're always forcing something that your body doesn't want. You're never at homeostasis. Think about it. 
you're if you're gaining, you're always giving your body more food than it really wants. Okay, disruption. What about if you're losing fat? Well, you're restricting food that your body wants to eat, but you can't. Physiology aside, that is psychologically burdensome, right? At some point, you just kind of want to chill. An example here is this. Going to work, right? Tough, weighs on you, you need a break. What if your idea of a break is hanging out with tons of friends and going to parties? It's a great time. It's super fun. But that kind of, in a sense, is also burdensome. It's not the same kind of burden as work, totally. But, you know, you got to call everyone, text everyone, get people together, go to the club. Clubbing's fun, but you got to move around a lot. Drinks, who's buying, blah, 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 late nights. It's fun, but it wears on you. How many of you guys have ever been in a situation where you're working hard, partying hard, and at some point you're just like, you know what? I need a day of just Netflix and just me. You turn your phone off and you just sit there and you're just like, oh my God. Buffy the Vampire Slayer reruns have never been better. We all need that every now and again. Psychologically, the analogy is every now and again, you're just not massing anymore. You're not cutting anymore. You're just maintaining, just settling in, just training hard and heavy, but not at crazy volumes. You're not terribly worried about gaining muscle mass or really altering your diet. You're eating much more like a normal person, just keeping your protein in. It lets you really relax, really recharge, so that you can get into your next phase much more productively. I think it makes a lot of sense. And a lot of you folks are super hardcore. The psychology stuff would never even touch you. But it's something to be concerned with, especially for those of you who coach your own clients and help other people. Yeah, you might be a machine, but not all of your clients might be machines. So a maintenance phase every now and again may be a good thing. So how does that bring us to a phasic structure? Well, the long-term approach to gaining lots of muscle probably needs some gain phases. Right. Clearly, that's how we gain our muscle. Probably some maintenance phases to sort of pound in the gains a little harder and give ourselves a break. And fat loss phases to deal with the accumulated fat. So we really have sort of three distinct things we need to do. I mean, it's almost like if you're cooking in a kitchen, you have three distinct phases of the meal prep process that have to happen every single time. There's like the shopping slash arranging the cookware. And you can't make food without that. There's the actual cooking itself. And then there's the cleanup. I mean, there's three distinct phases. They occur sequentially. I mean, you're not cooking food that you haven't bought yet. You're not cleaning up food if there's nothing to clean. And you imagine, like, get you buy the food and you switch to the cleaning phase, but everything's clean, the food's in the fridge. You're like, ah, I guess I messed that up, right? So there's a, a, a three-way phasic structure that has a particular sequence. Get the food, cook the food, clean. Just the same way you put on the muscle, you maintain the muscle and relax a bit, you let the training volumes fall, and then you deal with the residual, very much like cleaning your kitchen, of cutting off that body fat that you gain during the gain process, and then you're back to square one, and you can keep going, and you have something actually accomplished during that time. Does that mean that all those phases have to occur in exactly that order every single time? Not necessarily, but generally, there's going to be that order and that structure. It's going to be logically oriented, and it's going to cause the best possible gains. Right. Do we always need to do maintenance phases after muscle gains? Probably not. Is this the order that's always needed? Probably not. But it's good to keep these concepts guiding us, right? And at least guiding our thinking so that we say, okay, we've done this phase. I don't care what the, you know, the dogma says of mass and then maintenance and then cut. What do I need after this phase? Okay, I just massed for a long time but I'm pretty beat up from training psychologically and physically. My volume has been really high. I want to get rid of this body fat, but I feel like I need a maintenance phase. And then boom, it answers question answers itself, right? And if you feel like you're doing a phase that just doesn't make any damn sense, you're, you're probably doing it wrong, right? A lot of this isn't so much common sense, but it is logical. It is rediscoverable. So you don't have to memorize any of this stuff. It's not dogmatic. All right. So, what does mass gain look like in real life? I'm going to show you a real complex example. We're just going to spot the trends that we see. So this is an example of post-bodybuilding show periodization. A person in phase one over here all the way on the left is going to start out with a little green arrow. And this is a, a percent fat scale. They start out at 5% fat and then the top end is 15% fat. And of course, it's going to be some muscle gain there and some fat gain. And... Um, the duration here is really actually very long. Each one of these little hash marks is two weeks. This is like, I don't know, like an ungodly number. It's like ha uh, almost a year or something like that, right? Half a year. So post-show periodization looks something like this. 
You go through a little bit of a gain phase right after the show because you're super dieted down. Then you do a maintenance phase because you're super fatigued from what? From going down for weeks and weeks and weeks after a bodybuilding show. And then from training with high volumes to get a little bit of muscle back after the show, you're real fatigued. That's a four-week maintenance phase, color-coded in the blue there in the number two, right? And then what are you going to do? Well, you know, your fatigue is down. You're still pretty lean. Notice we end that phase, that maintenance phase at 9% body fat. Hey, rock on. That's pretty lean. We have tons of room to go up all the way to 13% fat with that number three arrow, the green arrow. We gain lots of muscle, so that's really sweet. And that's like a 12-week muscle gain phase, right? Right there in the middle of things, pretty good. What do we do after? Well, we said it's gain and then maintain and then fat loss. Sometimes we can do specialty phases called mini cuts, and we'll have much more videos. We have a whole book on mini cuts out in RP, right? Uh, and, and they can uh, f serve as sort of combination maintenance and cutting phases. Their volumes are low enough to resensitize some potential for growth and volume. Uh, they don't burn a ton of body fat off, they just buy you a little more mass phase time by getting a little bit leaner so you can get more out of it. So we do that little a mini cut phase, and then we do another phase of going up and gaining uh, much more muscle and some fat. Then we find ourselves at 15% fat in this male example. 15% fat, okay, it's not the end of the world, but you know, let's say if it's a bodybuilder, that's probably about as far as we'll go. We do uh, we have some good fatigue now, not a ton, because we haven't been gaining for months and months and months. It's just been, you know, like 12 weeks, eight weeks, not a terribly long time. And remember that mini cut was probably a little bit lower volume that bought us some time. But now we can't just do a mini cut again. We got to do a maintenance phase. It's just two weeks, just to cool the jets a little, get a little bit of uh, desensitization to training volume. I'm sorry, resensitization to training volume to take a little breath and not train so hard after that we can do another mini cut potentially but now that doesn't buy us much time right phase number eight there we only got four weeks of muscle gain I remember we really said that anything under a month is a real bad idea so a month is a hard limit of there's no way we can do shorter so now we have a really interesting paradigm here where we're like okay so if we're just gonna go up and down up and down up and down it, you know we're not getting bought enough time here to really have productive massing phases because if we if we bought enough time we'd have to do a longer cut to get us leaner to let us mass gain so that we wouldn't end up way north of 15 percent what we do then well, we're nice and fatigued we take a maintenance phase of four weeks, really drop fatigue, and then we take a 10-week fat loss phase. This is not a mini cut, that's a real fat loss phase. And we'll scoot over to the next slide. That phase continues there, and it takes us all the way from roughly 15% body fat in the last slide, right at the beginning of that fat loss phase of 10 weeks, all the way down to 10%. And then we're ready to begin that process pretty much all over again. We take a maintenance phase of four weeks. Why are we taking a maintenance phase right after that 10-week fat loss plan? It's 10 weeks is a long time to diet. We have a lot of accumulating fatigue. We want to drop a little of it before we really have good high-quality training for 12 weeks straight on a, mass, on a muscle gain phase. Again, into that muscle gain phase, a little bit of a mini cut, another muscle gain push, maintenance, so on and so forth. You can see the structure. So now that you know these principles of periodization, that doesn't mean every program you design is going to be the same. It doesn't mean it's going to look like this one, but you're going to design programs and you're going to say, okay, we're going to gain muscle for so long. We might do a mini cut, maybe not. At some point, fatigue is too high, we need a maintenance phase. At some point, we're too uh, high body fat, we need to do a fat loss phase, so on and so forth. So it all ends up being in a very logical structure. Uh, you know, there's a, uh, you know, we could do like uh, potentially uh, lay out this whole periodization and talk about how to interact with bodybuilding shows, so on and so forth. That gets more into fat loss periodization, which will be another course altogether. But basically, here's the deal. Everything about periodization in muscle gain comes from constraints and from the logical inferences of those constraints. Look, ideally, I would love to sit here and say, we don't need to periodize for muscle gain. You just eat and train and grow. That stops working super well. We have problems that arise. That's like saying, um, ideally... Would you want a car that doesn't require refueling, either a re battery recharge or any gasoline? Well, of course, who the hell would deny that? Nobody wants to argue that, well, we, we, we should have cars refueled because it gives gas station employees jobs. Well, they could have 50 other jobs. Why the hell are we wasting their time? The thing is, there's a constraint that power and energy are not free. So we have to charge our batteries. We have to uh, you know, put gasoline in our cars. That means we have to stop on the freeway every now and again. That might be a good time to also use the bathroom, get some snacks. So we have the structure developed when we drive your car for long enough and then it runs out of fuel, you stop. Drive your car, there's a stopping phase. And then there's a going phase and a stopping phase. And someone would say like, well, that's kind of arbitrary. Like, why are you just designing it that way? We didn't design it that way. 
it was developed because of necessities, because of constraints. It's because we can't mass forever, we get super fat and get all those negatives, that we have the birth of fat loss phases. And because we can't gain weight, fat loss, gain weight, fat loss infinitely because of fatigue and training related problems and so on and so forth, that we have the birth of maintenance phases. And when we sequence them all together, we get the best results that we possibly can in the real world. Not the ideal world, but the world that actually works. And the world gets more and more real for you in muscle gain, the more advanced you get. So when you're a beginner, you might just first two years, you could just gain mass and no problem. You're going to have reality hit you in the face for higher body fat, more resistant to training, more likely to fatigue. And then you're going to have to develop more keen strategies, such as these periodization ones, to stay ahead of the game and keep making reliable gains. Folks, that's it for this lecture. Next time, we're going to talk about super important concept, how to adjust your calories and macros when all of this planning doesn't quite fit and you're not gaining fast enough or you're gaining too fast or your whatever results you're getting are not good enough how do we make adjustments to the basic principles to keep you coming back to the right track or gaining on the right track see you then